Welcome everybody again. Um, I'm really, really happy that we conduct this webinar today. Um, there were several occasions um, that led us to organize this webinar. Um, first of all, uh, 8th of March was International Women's Day. And at this occasion, Inkota published a fact sheet, um, Women's Rights and Mining, it is in German. But I am going to summarize um, some of the key facts later on um, after uh, having heard the inputs and perspectives from um, Judy and Lynn from the Philippines and the Great Lakes region. Um, and then, of course, the debates um, at political level are really vivid at the moment. Um, around International Women's Day on, on 3rd March, the German cabinet uh, decided on a German supply chain law, which would oblige um, German companies to conduct human rights due diligence. Um, we are going to come back later uh, to this, well, to the to the draft, to the to the law, and also maybe potential shortcomings. Um, and then on 10th uh, of March, also at European Union level, a lot happened because uh, the European Parliament adopted a um, legislative own initiative report, also on mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence of corporations. And so we are seeing at least um, in, in Europe, a lot is happening, but not only in Europe, we are going to also um, shed light on, on a few political debates happening elsewhere. Um, and yeah, that's why we, why we are having this webinar today. I'm really happy um, to have Judy Persimio um, with us. She's uh, the coordinator of LILAC, um, an NGO working in the Philippines. Um, and she's going to speak about the impact of the mining sector on indigenous women's rights and also their struggle in the Philippines. Um, then we also have Lynn Gitu amongst us. She's um, working at IMPACT, an international NGO um, based, well, not based in Ottawa, but she's based in Uganda and she's going to shed light on the situation of women's rights in the artisanal small scale mining sector, especially in the Great Lakes region. And we have Caroline Seitz with us. She's working at Global Policy Forum and going to give us um, an introduction also on the different political debates on gender responsive due diligence and also civil society calls um, for the German, EU and UN level. I'm going to introduce them um, later in a bit more details. Um, but I would now like to hand over to Judy Passimio who's going to give the first input. Um, I already said she's the coordinator of LILAC. LILAC stands for Purple Action for Indigenous Women's Rights um, and is also council member of the National Alliance Against Mining in the Philippines. And so now I give the floor to Judy, who is going to share her. Hello, um, good morning, good afternoon and <laughs> good evening for us here in the Philippines. Um, so if I can share my screen. Um, yeah, so um, in a, oops, sorry. Oh, wait, hang on. Sorry about that. Uh, hang on, hang on. <laughs> uh, all right. Where am I? Um, <clears throat> Julius, are you mad at me already? You know? All right, there. All right, so um, very short uh, time for me to share my um, the situation in the Philippines, but let me get straight to it. Um, mining has always been touted as the, you know, one of the pillars of economic development in the Philippines. Um, but for almost, Three decades it has failed to do so, no, and so just just to show um, how Philippines look looks like, no. Um, here, um, that's the that's our forest cover. Uh, it has drastically uh, diminished over the decades, um, and that's the mining tenement uh, overlay in the forest uh, cover in the Philippines. Um, the Philippines is an archipelagic country situated in the Western Pacific Ocean and sits in the Pacific Rim of Fire. So we are very prone to typhoons, earthquakes, uh, 
landslides, but we're also rich in minerals, gold, copper, silver, uh, nickel, and some rare earth metals and magnetite sand. Getting these minerals cost us a lot um, in terms of impact on the agriculture, um, fisheries, and ecotourism. Um, so I've shown you the, the overlay in the forest cover here. You would see um, these are the important bird area and then the key biodiversity area and then the protected area overlay with the uh, mining tenements in the Philippines. Um, and, and I'm specifically uh, going to discuss the issues of indigenous women uh, and they're situated within the ancestral domains in the Philippines. And these are the areas where the indigenous communities are and their ancestral domains. And that's where the mining tenements. Um, so just by the, just by the, um, the maps that I've shown, we call it the land conflict maps, you know, because clearly there's a, there's a clash of the land use and valuation of land and forests, uh, and with so much destruction, uh, we ask what do the mining investments have to show for? Uh, and as I've said, I'm focusing now on the realities of women human rights, particularly uh, within indigenous and rural communities. Um, I'm just going to go through uh, quickly on these photos because I know that uh, uh, we're all very familiar with the impacts of mining. Um, generally, so land grabbing, um, the loss of sovereignty, um, especially for women no? uh, who have control over the seeds, over the seasons of planting, um, but now they've been taken over by the CEOs of these mining corporations. Um, and we know that when we talk about uh, the mining industry, we're not just talking about the minerals, we're talking about the forests, we're talking about the, the waters. Um, our law has very specific, uh, law in the Philippines on mining has very specific provisions that it uh, extends auxiliary rights to the mining companies over waters and forests. And so it's the, it's the control of these natural resources. And, and it has been expanding the industry. Now, the mining companies have control over energy sectors as well. Um, and they are, these energy projects are also um, encroaching upon ancestral domains, which are made or constructed to provide energy to the mining uh, industry. Um, of course, there's displacement. Uh, in the time of COVID, uh, last year, when we're talking about, at least in the Philippines, we're talking about, uh, not in the Philippines alone, no? but we're talking about social, uh, social distancing, we're talking about washing your hands often, and we're talking about um, the need for nutritious foods. But displacements are currently happening in the southern part of the Philippines because of the mining, uh, uh, not yet occupation of the mining industries, but the speculations of having these mining corporations in the area of the Muslim Mindanao. And so amidst COVID, uh, these communities have been displaced, no social distancing, no access to water, and food as uh, they have been relying only on uh, relief packs, which are very difficult to come by given the lockdown. Um, of course, environmental destruction, which leads to the creation of new poor. I say creation of new poor because the rural and indigenous women are basically, uh, how do you say that? Um, they have access to their own food. They have access to their own um, little but uh, sufficient uh, livelihood. But when the destruction of environment caused by mining uh, happened, they've lost access to all of these. Uh, and therefore, suddenly they found themselves uh, um, food poor uh, and opportunities poor as well. Uh, the benefits uh, that have been given to supposedly communities do not uh, translate to economic opportunities to indigenous communities because they lack the the skills required by these mining operations 
but specifically for women. Um, they have been marginalized uh, from their from their usual sources of uh, food and resources. Um, and and not only that, um, the the the, true, uh, the the small opportunities being opened up by the mining companies in uh, in situations where they accommodate indigenous communities. For women, it's a um, it's a duplication of domestic chores. They tend to the laundry of the mining miners. They tend to the cooking of food. So there's no real development opportunity for the indigenous women in these mining areas. Um, uh, this just uh, really picked my interest because they they kept calling criminal water, and I realized they were referring to the mineral water that is now the, uh, that is now uh, available not available but that's something that they have to buy now. Whereas before, the uh, water is very accessible to them. Now they have to buy, and so they say, and because the water that is available there is not is no longer safe to drink. They have to buy bottled waters, and so they are calling it criminal water instead of mineral. And then, of course, you have the issues of prostitution of women. Uh, in one of the areas that we work closely with, uh, the main issue is the creation of or the establishment of uh, video pay and karaoke bars, where women uh, uh, have been recruited to provide uh, sex work. And, and now um, with the climate change, uh, and this was just last year, no? Uh, successive um, typhoons happened in mined areas, in mining areas, uh, which really exacerbated the hunger that has been uh, caused by the lockdown. Philippines has the longest lockdown uh, for COVID. Uh, uh, from March 16 up until now, we're in various stages of lockdown, but basically in in, in strict quarantine. And so um, where there were pests because of the uh, climate change, now there were also uh, typhoons affecting their, their remaining land and remaining vegetable gardens. Um, and they were saying uh, because of the food insecurity, they had to go to areas where supposedly are close to human activities because they are sacred for them, um, but they have to go through. They have to go into those areas now because of the lack of uh, lack of available lands, uh, which have not yet been destroyed by the typhoons or by the mining corporations. And so, the environment and cultural integrity of the communities are now really compromised. Um, and of course, as women, um, their right to information, their right to participation, their right to consultation uh, have been consistently violated. But more so as indigenous women, their right to free prior informed consent has never been um, has never been honored. Uh, and they and the companies would say, oh well, we rely on the culture of the community. And so if it's patriarchal and therefore no place for women, that's not our call. Um, and, and, and so they they uh, take advantage of uh, such situations um, and therefore not push for women's rights or right to be involved in any decision-making processes uh, related to the entry of the mining corporations in their area. So their leadership has been undermined um, and yes, domestic violence, and again, especially now in the lockdown, um, issues of domestic violence in mining areas uh, where some might, some have lost their jobs, uh, and so they would turn to their women, to the women who are very actively involved in, uh, in resisting mining. Um, that has caused uh, or exacerbated um, domestic violence. Uh, and, divis and divisiveness in the communities. Um, and I'll just go through the increased vulnerabilities. No, we, we have consistently heard this in mining areas where women have no participation at all in, uh, in decision making. Um, and so now uh, with the communities that we work with, 
strong communities before, uh, the power has shifted. Um, now it's the indigenous women versus the corporation. Um, they're, they're left alone by the national and local government to deal directly with the forces of the corporations entering their local their ancestral domains. Now they have to contend with local speculators and local traders on their own because the government has um, has left them. Uh, in, um, and now women are also um, having this conflict with men in the communities, men particularly who are being wooed and uh, taken um, won over by the corporations and of course by uh, women versus other women um and, and later i can discuss this why is that so um yeah so in the end rural indigenous women are really at the uh, losing end uh and the community and all that it represents and possess has all been wiped out um and so we've seen over the years rural women, indigenous women at the forefront of the struggles. Um, they have they have uh, engaged in hunger strike. They've engaged in numerous rallies, even if it's not really part of their culture, they say, but now they are on the streets um, to be able to express uh, their, their dissent. And what has been the response of the state? Violence, um, killings, killings of indigenous women leaders, killings of activists on the ground. And while it has happened uh, in previous administrations, because uh, in fact, in one previous administration, there has been a creation of investment defense force um, to protect uh, to protect the investors uh, rather than um, the communities. But with the new government, not so new anymore, but with Duterte government, uh, the killings has been rampant. It has been made normal. Um, in fact, over the, here you would see uh, a violent dispersal of a people's barricade, mostly by women who barricaded their tiny village because the permit of the Oceana Gold or the um, Australian Mining Corporation has already expired. And so they put up this, people's barricade to not allow the entry of the trucks. Um, but during lockdown, this government allowed 100 policemen to disperse a 15 people, mostly women, uh, barricade. And so that has caused so much trauma and injury. And they have been at the, uh, they have been filed cases uh, against, uh, a um, cases have been filed against them for for, for uh, allegedly uh, breaking the, the protocols, the quarantine protocols. Um, and one of the, how do you say that, the main instrument of this government to try to weaken the resistance of the indigenous communities and indigenous uh, and human rights workers are the red tagging is what we call it. Red tagging to mean labeling or calling someone as a as a rebel terrorist, uh, and and uh, and this has become really dangerous. Once you're red tagged by these military men, um, the almost daily on a daily basis, this president would give the instructions: kill, kill, kill. In fact, last year, uh, last week. Um, he said, if I have to go to jail, then let it be. Uh, but the instruction is to kill, kill, kill uh, um, terrorists and rebels, which are basically, who are basically uh, land rights defenders and indigenous leaders. During the pandemic, the Anti-Terrorism Act was passed. And again, this is so broad that anyone who expresses dissent is a terrorist. Uh, and in fact, indigenous communities have suffered indigenous men and women through uh, since the beginning of last year up until this year uh, almost on a monthly basis you would have reports of being indigenous being killed and being arrested and all of them are strongly opposed to the entry of development projects in their areas but particularly mining and so 
when we were having a discussion with Lara as to what to present, what to present here, I thought uh, maybe I should touch on uh, how gender rights have been uh, have been used by the extractive industry, uh, and it's actually a growing industry within the Philippines. Um, feminists, women researchers have been recruited to address gender rights within the ranks of mining uh, industries. Um, and they've selected indigenous leaders um, to be their spokespersons. But it has really become near checklist of, uh, have there been any consultations with women? Check. Has there been livelihood provided for women? Check. But no substantive fundamental changes in how mining has been conducted or how mining has been decided to be conducted within the, within their communities and ancestral domains. And so the struggle continues, um, not just by resisting the entry of the mining corporations in the, in the ancestral domains, but also proposing an alternative minerals management bill, which would encompass all the, uh, the protection of rights as well as the protection of the environment and natural resources. Um, so yeah. Uh, we continue to resist, we continue to assert, even at time when resisting and asserting is dangerous, not just because of COVID, but because of the growing authoritarianism and dictatorship of this government. I will share more later. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, um, Judy. This is really insightful. And um, I already have some, some questions I would like to, to ask to you, but um, I would encourage the audience also to collect questions to you. And, and now we would have um, a minute also to clarify comprehensive questions. If you didn't understand anything, um, you want to know more about a specific aspect. Um, but then after the second input of Lynn, uh, we will have a bit more space also to discuss the local implications for women's rights in the Philippines and the Great Lakes region. I've already seen the a question in the chat. Um, I, if, it's, um, if it's fine, we would um, take this question for, for the debate after Lynn's input. But if there are any more questions, understand a specific aspect better, um, please feel free now. Okay, at the moment not. Um, yeah, but you still have time. Um, so uh, thank you very much, Judy. Um, we would now move on in the still the first part uh, where we dive in to the local impacts of women's rights um, who are affected uh, by mining or inside the mining industry. So now we have uh, first heard about the impact on indigenous women's rights and also rural women in the Philippines. And we would now move on to the women's rights in the artisanal small scale mining sector in the Great Lakes region. And so take more the internal perspective of uh, women working in the sector. And, and therefore I would um, like to introduce Lynn. Lynn Gitu is a leaning um, professional, uh, specialized also on uh, social justice. Um, she has experience working in the NGO sector for, um, for 12 years, has uh, worked on advocacy for management of land, energy, and extractive resources in East and Central and Southern Africa. And currently, she is leading the Uganda team of IMPACT. Um, IMPACT, the NGO, is called Transforming Natural Resource Management. Um, and I'm now handing over to Lynn uh, to present us also the perspective on artisanal small scale mining um, based on your experiences at IMPACT. And um, afterwards, we will have uh, some space for uh, more in depth questions discussion before we'll have a small break and move on to the second part. Over to you, Lynn. All right. Thank you, Lara. I hope um, I'm clear. I can be heard. Well, I'll just share my screen quickly. Okay. Uh, yes, so I'm from the organization Impact, and we've been working in the Great Lakes region for 
30 plus years now. Uh, we started out as a small civil society coalition and then we transitioned into um, a research institution and as of you know 2014 we we, we started to become more an, an NGO. Uh, in 2017 we changed our name from Partnership Africa Canada to impact and we added a tagline to to the name impact transforming natural resource management uh, because um, our heart and commitment is towards uh, building the capacity of, of uh, local actors in the countries where we work to to challenge how their natural resources are managed um, and so on um, so I, I i just want to jump quickly into the the, the, the findings of a, of a research that we did in, in Uganda, in DRC, and in Rwanda. Uh, the focus of this research was women miners within the, the artisanal and small-scale uh, mining communities of, of the, the minerals tin, tungsten, tantalum, and gold. These four minerals are at the interest of of um, many actors at the international level and have been sometimes co been called uh, conflict minerals. Uh, at, at, at the moment, the, the EU is, um, uh, has passed or started to put into action a regulation uh, that, that focuses on these, on these four minerals. So that the study that we did between 2015 and 2017 was just to examine the barriers women face and their opportunities for, for empowerment. And issues around their rights um, came, came, came forth. And those are the things that, that we, where I will focus on in, in my short time with you. So the first um, uh, rights issue that, that uh, was raised was uh, around employment rights. And what we found was that women face barriers to employment in the mining sector, mostly because of discriminatory beliefs um, around the impropriety of mining by married women. So it's, it's looked at like uh, no married woman should be found in, in a mining pit or at a mining site doing actual mining. Uh, because uh, that's not proper, you know, married women um, are supposed to stay at home, take care of children, uh, look out for the interests of their husbands instead of uh, trying to, to make a living from the mining sector. Uh, so that, that, um, that meant that from the, from the survey that we did, that the research that we did, we found that most women at mining uh, sites are actually uh, either single or, you know, single without children or single with children because um, somehow their, their marital relationships didn't work out because of that impropriety uh, issue. The other rights issue that, that was raised uh, from doing this research was uh, economic rights. And it's quite simply, women have very limited access to credit facilities to, en to enable them to scale up their operations and get into more productive ventures. So, so then that meant that um, that practically was seen in the fact that most of the women that we found at mining sites were actually selling uh, goods, uh, service, uh, providing services, the washing of clothes, the cooking food, uh, uh, collecting water for the for the miners uh, to to be used in the process, and 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 that uh, that that obviously even though it gives uh, some income, it doesn't give uh, the most the, the most income uh, from from the mining sector. Uh, the other rights issue that that was raised was uh, around freedom from discrimination. Uh, we, we, we found after uh, uh, reviewing and, and, and looking at the laws and policies within uh, these, these three countries that in some places, the laws and poli policies contributed to gender discrimination and women's exclusion from mining. 
uh, and yet we know that women's mining activity is, is both valuable to the sector and provides for an important part of, of uh, community income. Uh, in, 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 for example, the DRC mining code and some regulations, we, we found that uh, they are very specifically banned from mining if they are pregnant. So this does, does, it doesn't matter whether it is in the first trimester or, you know, um, or that, the, that this particular woman's uh, health is good and she's strong. Uh, as long as there's, there's pregnancy, uh, you're not allowed to be involved uh, in, in the mining at, at, at any point. Um, the other right issue that, that uh, was raised was a right to education and, and skills development. Uh, we found that women within the mining sector, uh, with, within the, the, these three, uh, these four minerals, that they have fewer opportunities to access training uh, and to, to strengthen their legal knowledge of, of the sector, which is very important because it's, we will know that within the Great Lakes region, the, the legal and regulatory framework of the mining sector is constantly changing because of how interesting it is for, for the governments within the region. So uh, we pointed out this issue around uh, legal knowledge because, uh, because it's, it's, it's very key uh, within the sector and uh, the more illiterate women are, the less able they are to participate uh, better within the sector because they don't understand uh, the legal ramifications of, of the sector and the requirements. And I, I think I should also raise here the piece around uh, formalization. Within the Great Lakes region, there is a big push towards formalization, professionalization, organization of, of, of the artisanal and small scale mining sector. But, but uh, those requirements and, and those moves and those, that, that progress within the sector to formalize uh, is, is done without consideration of the high levels of illiteracy on the on women's part, which will obviously push them out of the sector. Uh, the other rights issue that we, we saw was a, a right to a fair wage. Um, mining roles in, in many mining sites uh, tend to be divided by gender and, and they vary by site. Roles reserved for men, such as digging, and significantly more than those reserved for women, such as grinding or panning uh, in the gold sector. Even when they perform the same role, we found like washing, for example, women uh, and less. Um, the other issue, I think uh, the last, the last uh, rights issue that we, we picked out was one around land rights. Um, and I think I pointed out that even though the laws in the three countries do not prohibit women from owning land per se, the reality is that in most mining communities, women do not have the opportunity to own land, which usually limits their ability to access credit facilities, as I had mentioned earlier, to invest uh, in mining activities uh, to increase their income. Yeah, so uh, these these are the uh, main issues that, that I picked up to share with you and I'm open to questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lynn, for your presentation. Um, I have learned a lot in this, these two uh, inputs that we had so far. And I, I guess that there are some questions in the audience. Um, there was already one directed to, to Judy. Um, maybe you just can uh, read it out and then the other yes. people have some time to, to write down the questions in the chat as well. Yes, the question is from Moritz Kramer and he asked, I think to Judy, but maybe it's interesting for both discussions. Uh, what can Western NGOs do to support women's rights in your country? Maybe Judy wants to, to start. Um, well, solidarity has always been a feminist <laughs> um, trait, but also uh, international solidarity has always worked. Um, but apart from that, I think uh, raising the bar for uh, or for companies and corporations uh, coming from Western 
uh, countries operating in our countries uh, and the push for, for from the women's groups and uh, the human rights groups in these Western uh, countries can push for a higher bar in uh, in uh, respect and um, protection of human rights uh, and and joining us amplifying the the fact that uh, these mining corporations are violating uh, um, and causing human rights abuse in our countries that in itself would be very helpful in our uh, in our struggle Thank you. Maybe Lynn also has a has an opinion on this question. Um, yes, I, I would say that I I largely agree with uh, with with Judy that that the whole aspect of international advocacy and the fact that uh, these the Western donors um, are coming from countries where uh, big mining companies come from and 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 their interest mining companies interest in investing in in our countries uh, it means that there's at least a, a level ground when it comes to conversations around human rights protection and, and so on women's women's rights women's uh, equality and, and empowerment so there's there's um, a strength that western donors have there to do international advocacy at that level um, on our behalf. Thank you. Um, I'm looking to Julius to know if there are more questions coming in. If not, I would also have uh, one or two. <laughs> there is uh, a comment. Uh, Caroline uh, Bunga in there says, uh, the presentation by Lynn is an eye open for the gender actors to take up the role of empowering women with skills to add value addition to the four minerals mentioned in the Great Lakes region. Yes, thank you for your comment. And yeah, you can still type in questions. If not, I would refer to Lara. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, I think that's the case. Questions will follow. Um, yeah, I have a question for each of you. Um, first to, to Judy. Um, Judy, you spoke, a, you spoke a lot about also the criminalization of land rights defenders of indigenous women fighting for their land, for their community rights and against um, human rights abuses of the mining corporations. Um, I, th I think for us, from a European perspective, it's so brave that these women continue their struggle, even though they are intimidated. Um, but what would be needed also to strengthen, to protect um, their right, first of all, to, to freedom of speech? Um, um, what should, should be done maybe by civil society, but maybe also by politicians um, to, to stop this criminalization? Um, maybe the corporations also have a role here. Um, what do you think? Um, if you look at the cabinet or the people who make up this government, they have huge interests in the corporations. Um, they have huge interests in mining. And so um, they are really working hand in hand in stifling the dissent uh, and the voices of, the, of those who are opposed uh, against these projects. For the, for the last two years, 19, I'm sorry, 20, 19 and 2020, Philippines has been has had the highest number as uh, of land rights defenders killed as per the Human Rights Watch. Um, so what what can be done? Remove <laughs> remove the biggest threat in the lives of the uh, of us activists and human rights defenders, um, and that's this government. But apart from removing this government in different ways that we can think of, and one would well, the, 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 the nearest opportunity would be the elections um, next year. Um, but there has to be a drastic change of how we look at our natural resources and how we are allowing or not allowing corporations to rule the development 
uh, framework of our government. Um, and so whoever sits there but has the same uh, mindset and has the same framework of uh, corporate uh, development framework, profiting from profiteering from our uh, natural resources, then the perpetrator will just change, but there will always be a repeat of such abuses and violations. And so, so yeah, um, there has to be a radical shift of how we're looking at our natural resources and development and how we are allowing corporations to rule our governance system. Thank you for your answer. Um, I think there have been some more questions coming in. Yes, yes. Uh, we have a question, uh, a general question for both discussants uh, about the number of uh, women that work in, a, in the mining sector in your countries. Do you have a number and estimation you can give us? That's one question. And yeah, maybe we start with that and you can give a guess. Okay, so from, from the Great Lakes region, the percentage is between 30 to 65 percent of, of, the, of, of uh, the miners uh, are women. Uh, it depends on, on the type of mineral and also the country. And even within countries, the region. So it's, it's varied. So that's why we have a varied... Um, uh, a sort of a sliding scale, so 30 to 65 percent women. I'm sorry, but I can't answer that. I don't, uh, my organization, LILAC, uh, doesn't focus on women in the mining sector. Uh, we're mostly working with uh, communities who are opposed to mining. And so, yeah, sorry. All right, but I have another question for you, Judy. Um, maybe you can shed some light on this one. Um, could you tell us more about the bills that you are asking for in the Philippines? Um, our main bill or proposed law is the Alternative Minerals Management Bill. Uh, and it has been languishing in the Congress for for more than a decade now, um, it shifts the framework of uh, mining as uh, my as just mining per se, but putting it in a natural resource management framework. Uh, and it has more obligations for the mining corporations, and it has more restrictions and the rationalization when, where, and why you need to mine in these particular areas. But um, there are also some um, tactical bills, if you would call it. Um, we're push, uh, some communities are also pushing for no-go zone areas, so very specific to uh, some areas that need to be declared as no-go zone. So while pending for a you know uh, a big shift with the alternative minerals management bill, perhaps no-go zone areas can be achieved and there's there has been one uh, no go zone areas we're also pushing for uh, local governments to take a stance and declare their areas uh, as a uh, declare their own either moratorium on uh, open pit mining or moratorium on mining or uh, declare by their declare themselves the no go zone areas uh, and one uh, also, one important bill that we're also pushing is what we call the Human Rights Defenders Bill. Uh, this provides more protection for land rights defenders, women's rights defenders, basically your human rights defenders. Um, um, but while we're also pushing for these laws, we're also opposing this most current law, which is the anti-terror law. Uh, and so we have filed cases, uh, we have filed petition with the Supreme Court to nullify this law. And I'm I'm so proud to just to refer to what Lara was saying a while ago that these women have uh, have really 
are really courageous to continue the resistance. And one stance that they really took, which was for me very definitive, was uh, the their, the indigenous women filing a case with the Supreme Court against this anti-terror law. It's a, for me, it's a really in your face, standing up to this violent misogynist uh, president. Thank you. I have two more questions, more or less concerning the role of the mining industry. Um, the first one uh, is uh, addressed uh, to Judy. Um, um, the question is, what role is the mining industry uh, playing uh, in enforcing the rights or the pro protecting the rights of women in the sector? And the other question is kind of similar. This is why I will uh, read it out as well. Uh, are there positive examples of projects that include women in economic development? And what do mining companies uh, need to do to ensure uh, the rights of, of local women. Maybe, yeah, we can answer one or both. I'm, I'm reading the other one. I think it's, I think what Caroline here was asking the role of the mining ministry. Ah, ministry, uh, yeah. I read industry, I'm <laughs> sorry. So we don't right. have a mining ministry. What we have is a Department of Environment and Natural Resources. Um, and this is the department. This is the agency. No, no. This is the agency that issues uh, permits uh, for mining uh, and environmental impact assessment, all of these clearances. Um, and there's also the National Commission on Indigenous Peoples, which is supposed to issue the free prior informed consent, which is a requirement by this uh, Department of Environment to finally issue the, the permit. But uh, as in, the, we have very good laws. If you look at our environmental impact assessment, that has been the model for the other Asian countries. Uh, if you look at the Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, where the free prior informed consent has been uh, uh, articulated, the other Asian countries are looking at it to, to pass it in their own countries. That's how good the articulations are in these laws. However, um, because of the mindset uh, that, we, that I have been discussing, these laws are easily circumvented. These laws are easily, uh, um, um, yeah, circumvented and manipulated. The processes are manipulated both by the government themselves and by the corporations. And so, so what does it do? In fact, to answer very um, clearly, the Department of Environment and Natural Resources is now called by the communities, the, the, the Department of Envi uh, the Destruction of Environment and Natural Resources because it, has, it offers no protection at all. Thank you. Now we heard about the ministry, <laughs> now about the industry. Um, yeah, there's a question, I think, to both, but maybe uh, Lynn can start since uh, Judy talked a lot. Um, are there positive examples of projects that include women in economic development in your country? And what do mining companies need to do to ensure that local women also benefit from the projects? Um, okay. Well, I think I, I think what I have to keep uh, reminding us is that within the Great Lakes region, ninety percent of mineral production is is um, uh, is done or comes from from artisanal miners. So we have very few uh, large scale uh, mining companies. Uh, most most of them are medium scale. Uh, there are some large scale within the DRC, uh, for sure. Um, positive examples, to 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 be honest, um, none. I can't I can't think of any within within the region. However, they there have been some pockets of um, I would say interventions or, or or 
or progress towards uh, supporting uh, women's uh, empowerment within the mining sector by by some by some companies uh in in the drc and and in rwanda there have been instances uh, where uh, companies have worked together with financial institutions within their their mining areas to to put together small funds that that allow women specifically women to access uh, credit facilities that would allow them to invest uh, in, in, in their, their small or either artisanal or, or small scale mining, mining ventures. This has been mostly in relation to the, the, the three T minerals, the tin, tungsten and tantalum, which, which are, are very key in the production of electronics. So yeah, that's, that's one good thing that we have seen. I, I will not mention companies specifically, but I, I think that is uh, one one good thing that, that that we have seen. In terms of what do mining companies need to do to ensure that, that women also benefit, I, I'll go back to to something that I, I keep harping on about, and, and it's, it's called a gender impact assessment. If you don't know uh, what's, what's happening within your mining um, area or the place where you have been licensed to, to do mining as a company, then you don't know how to intervene, right? Uh, gender impact assessments have been lumped up together with social impact assessments, which are lumped together with environmental impact assessments. So in terms of, of hierarchy, you find that a gender impact assessment is at the very bottom of, 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 the, of the priority list for, for, for impact assessments. But if companies can, can make it a habit uh, and a practice to to do impact gender specific gender impact assessments before they do work and even as they continue to do work in mining areas, then they will know what the needs are and, and the opportunities for inclusion for, for, for women. Otherwise, they continue to do the usual things or build a healthcare center uh, so that women can go there to give birth. But women don't want to do that. They want to give birth to their children in their homes and they've been doing it for centuries and they've been fine. So you don't assume as a mining company what is right for the community, uh, but you find out. And the only way that you find out is if you do an assessment before you go in. Yeah. Yeah, the quick answer is like what Lynn was saying. I cannot think of anything um, that uh, but, but there are um, small projects, and that's how mining companies do it in the Philippines. Uh, in the beginning, especially before, before the actual conduct of the environmental impact assessment and the conduct of three prior informed consent processes, they, they, um, uh, they release lots of funds for different projects. Uh, and as I mentioned in my earlier in my presentation, um gender uh, empowerment has been a buzz and so they they have uh, small uh, projects for women um but the the sad thing there is that it's very divisive they only choose women who are for their own projects or they think they can sway to their projects and so to the actual mining project and so uh, it really causes division uh, and while in some areas it's really very um, pathetic, one Australian mining corporation reported as part of its gender projects, uh, gender friendly projects, uh, is uh, the conduct of beauty pageants every year uh, and uh, provision of water bottles, considering that they were the cause of having. Of, of sucking all the water sources, they provide water bottles. So, you know, um, these are very um, band-aid solutions just so to have a checklist of, yeah, we focused on women. So, so that's how our experiences are. Thank you. I have a short last question, maybe. It's directed to Lynn. Uh, I think the person is uh, from Uganda who's asking it. Uh, the question is, uh, do, 
due to the uh, use of mercury in the mining industry. Uh, did you come across cases of women using mercury in the extractive sector? And yeah, the common is we know about the effects on of mercury uh, on the health of humans and and women. Do you have reports on on that? Uh, yes, yes, for sure. In within the gold gold mining sector, uh, mercury is used to to amalgamate or to collect um, gold from 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 sand and stones and and generally the ore that's taken out of the ground. And the truth is that it's um, it's the most effective chemical that that uh, that does this. Uh, quickly and most um, efficiently. So, so it's used very much within the artisanal and small scale mining sector. So it's 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 a lot, and um, the environmental management authorities within the Great Lakes region, uh, not not just in Uganda but but across the region, are getting more and more interested in in trying to eliminate or at least reduce the use of mercury or support communities to to use technologies that that ensure that they don't handle this mercury in their in their hands and uh, get it close to their bodies which which causes health problems but also that that uh, it's the use of it is managed properly within small processing plants that ensures that that uh, as much as possible it doesn't get into the soil and it doesn't get into the water because it affects food and and also fish and other aquatic uh, life. Uh, there's a question here which I can read uh, read my, myself, Julia. So I'll just I'll just uh, mention it. It's something to do with the progress of empowering women artisanals in, in the Great Lakes region to register their companies. I think this is a question around formalization. And yes, formalization is a big buzzword within the region, and um, it's it's being uh, taken up, of course, as as it rightly should by governments. Uh, the biggest progress that we have seen is in Rwanda, uh, where the, the the government of Rwanda has has taken formalization so seriously, uh, but but also women's inclusion in the mining sector, uh, that they they specifically support. Uh, women's associations, um, mining associations, to to legalize, to set up their paperwork and so on. They they subsidize their government fees uh, for for getting all their things in order. Um, yeah, uh, that, that's what I would answer in terms of progress. In Uganda, there is a biometric registration of artisanal miners, uh, and I think most most of the work to support women to register themselves and organize themselves has been done by by NGOs. The same thing in the DRC, the same thing in Zambia, really across the region. We see, um, yes, the, the governments come out with policies or decrees around formalization, but at the end of the day, uh, the, su the support or the help to women to, to, to formalize comes mostly from, from NGOs. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much um, for all your answers. I think uh, maybe there are even more questions, um, but we will have more time in the discussion um, after Caroline's input. Um, I'll briefly uh, share my own screen and hope you can see it. I guess you can see it now. Um, yeah, so um, we are going to um, have a small break. Um, I was on the wrong slide um, for, for three minutes. But before, um, I would just like to come back to our fact sheet from Encota. Um, I, I wanted to, to present it after the inputs from Lynn and, and Judy, because I already thought they would cover um, probably all the different dimensions um, we have addressed. The fact sheet is in German. That's why I have um, just um, translated a few of the uh, summary key findings um, here. We have already spoken about the huge role of women in the artisanal small-scale mining sector. They make much, um, a much higher percentage of the female um, miners than in large-scale mining. 
Um, we have spoken about um, socioeconomic uh, discrimination um, at work, but also the disproportionate socioeconomic impact on um, women in the communities. Um, we have um, spoken, or Judy has also highlighted the, the role of women in decision-making processes and that they often are also excluded from this and also from um, compensations by, um, by the companies. Um, we have addressed gender-based violence, um, sexual violence against women, um, and we are also going to um, come back in the, in the next discussion on political regulations on the aspect of um, hurdles to access to justice for women. Um, we have spoken about all the different dimensions. I think we have um, also spoken a bit about the cultural aspects, the community um, wide aspects and stereotypes in the mining sector. Um, and I think I would leave it here. You can, um, of course, um, if you speak German, also um, go back and read it in a bit more details um, afterwards. And um, yeah, now I think it's time for a small break. Um, I would say we would limit it to four minutes so that we meet again um, at 10 past three uh, Berlin time here. Um, and I hope that uh, not many people will leave because afterwards we will have a um, great um, insight from Carolyn um, to the debates at German, European and UN level that will help us to discuss afterwards also about the potentials and risks for uh, women's rights worldwide in, in, the, in and around the mining sector. So um, see you here in a bit, in uh, three, four minutes.
All right, welcome back to those who are already back. Linda's back as well. All right, um, so then we're going to, to continue. I'm um, going to share my screen briefly again. Um, so in, in, in the fact sheet, we have also addressed um, political initiatives um, at different levels. So voluntary initiatives um, at um, a multi-stakeholder level, um, there is an initiative, Women's Rights and Mining Initiative, um, with also international NGOs participating, um, governments like the Dutch government, the GIZ, the German Development um, Agency, and they have adopted women's empowerment principles also for the mining sector. Um, so they are trying to also inside mining companies to, um, to adopt these principles and to improve women's rights in, in the extractive sector. Um, at OECD level, um, there has been a stakeholder statement together with the Women's Rights and Mining Initiative on implementing gender responsive due diligence specifically in mineral supply chains. And I think Caroline is also going to come back to um, the gender dimensions of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, um, which have been adopted in 2019. Um, but besides all the political initiatives, um, there are many, many calls from transnational civil society um, really asking governments, um, decision makers at a regional UN level to include a gender equality perspective also in corporate due diligence legislation. Um, just uh, to say there's a feminist for binding treaty, there's a global policy forum, and therefore I'm really happy um, to, to introduce Caroline Seitz now. Um, Caroline studied political science and administration and political psychology. Today, she's the director of Global Policy Forum's Business and Human Rights Program. And since um, its start in 2014, she followed the process towards a UN treaty on business and human rights. And she's also been a founding member and the coordinator of the Treaty Alliance Germany, um, which groups 28 civil society organizations. Um, and Caroline has also published a position paper on gender justice in global supply chains um, that she's going to present shortly. So I hand over to Caroline now. Thank you, Lara. And um, good afternoon also from my side. I'm gonna share my screen my presentation um, so. i hope you can see everything so um yeah i think what what lynn and judy um described as as various forms of discrimination against women and um the various uh, uh yeah violation of women's rights um is not only um true for the mining sector, but also for quite a lot of other sectors. We find it in the, in the food and agriculture industry, um, or for example, in the textile sector, where a lot of women are working. And uh, the textile sector especially is one um, where it's, which is also very famous for um, very bad working conditions, um, low wages, um, yeah. So, when we now have a look, um, there are quite a lot of uh, existing standards already that deal with the topic of business and human rights and um, that um, make um, guidance on how business can respect human rights um, and environmental standards um, in their business operations. Um, we have the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, which have been established in 2011. We have the sustainable development goals and um, more recently we have also um, uh, yeah, uh, instruments that, that go more on the gender dimension um, in this whole topic. Um, we have there, for example, in the sustainable development goals, especially um, the, the goal number five, um, but also um, the the gender dimension um, guidance on the UN um, guiding principles on business and human rights, which have been established um, 2019. 
But uh, the problem is that um, we have a lot of these, um, these standards and for example, um, the UN uh, Women uh, and the global, UN Global Compact standards, um, women's, the women's empowerment principles, um, all of them are vol voluntary and a lot of um, companies, big companies, transnational companies have also committed publicly on these principles, but um, have not put them into practice. So um, because of this, um, we now talk on the various levels on um, different, on regulation, uh, on mandatory regulation of corporate responsibility. We have uh, such discussions as uh, Lara already said on the level of Germany. Um, we are expecting in the next month that it's, uh, the law is going to pass through the parliament. We have discussions on uh, mandatory human rights due diligence um, and uh, regulation on EU level. There we expect something to come uh, from the commission in June. And we have discussions um, on UN level in the UN Human Rights Council on a um, binding treaty on business and human rights. Um, there have been discussions uh, for six years now. We have a second revised draft uh, that has been discussed uh, last year in October. And we expect a, a third draft being presented in August, um, which will then be discussed and uh, negotiated further um, in the next session of the UN Working Group in October, end of October this year. Um, all of these, these initiatives um, for binding rules on corporate uh, responsibility um, have uh, very common um, aspects. Um, they include um, uh, provisions on mandatory human rights and environmental due diligence for companies along their supply chain. Um, this concept of due diligence has been um, well introduced um, and uh, developed um, by, uh, with the UN human rights um, uh, principles on business and human rights. And they um, include that companies have to identify risks and impacts um, with with respect to uh, human rights, um, that they try to seize and uh, remedying um, existing abuses, that they prevent and try to mitigate risks of abuses, um, and then that they uh, monitor and publicly um, report on the implementation and effectiveness of, their, of the measures um, they have taken. Furthermore, an important aspect is that they consult um, the potentially affected persons and groups. Um, well, the, the report and result of the processes and um, I already mentioned. And another aspect is that um, companies should provide um, complaint mechanism, mechanisms that are um, secure and accessible for, for, the, um, for affected persons. Another um, important aspect of most of the, the, um, these initiatives, legal initiatives, is um, that they think about how to enforce um, these um, due diligence provision and request. Um, and enforcement should be um, by legal liability in various forms, whether it be administrative, criminal, or uh, through uh, civil liability. And exactly this should, um, should be a tool in order to avoid what uh, Judy was saying, to have such a kind of a ticking box exercise um, that is only uh, on the paper. Um, but when you have a legal liability, you can really hold um, the company's account uh, to what they have been uh, presented on the paper um, and to check if, if it's true and in case of abuse, that they can be held um, liable and that you have sanctions. And another aspect is the whole um, uh, topic of access to remedy that is um, also included in this uh, liability um, 
uh, or in these legal initiatives. Um, and they, um, some of these initiatives um, have um, ideas on how to um, avoid or to overcome barriers to access to remedy. Um, yeah, what we have for the UN treaty, there are special um, additional aspects in um, the, the current draft on the UN treaty. Um, it has uh, articles on jurisdiction and um, apl the applicable law. Um, so in which country um, people are affected, victims can go um, to court, which um, law should be applied then. Um, then there are articles on international cooperation, meaning that um, if there are cases on uh, human rights violation, how they, um, how they can cooperate, um, for example, um, with regard to to enforcement or to investigation of cases. Um, then there is another article on the relationship of this treaty to other international law, for example, on um, trade and investment agreements. And finally, the, there is also a monitoring system um, proposed like uh, special treaty bodies um, and report obligations for states on how they implement um, and the state of implementation of this international um, agreement. So um, we have um, all of these, these uh, initiatives um, are currently drafted. Um, we don't have a German law, we don't have a, a EU directive yet, um, and we don't have a UN treaty, but we have drafts and um, we can see in these drafts that um, there are huge differences um, in very important aspects. Um, one aspect is the scope of application for the German law. It's um, foreseen that it's going to be, uh, that it's covering only um, or obliging only companies with more than 1,000 um, employees. Um, the, uh, the European um, ideas at least from the European Parliament are um, that it obliges all uh, companies that are active in the EU, uh, small as well as uh, larger companies. And also the UN treaty um, uh, is uh, currently uh, foresees to cover all companies, um, transnational corporations, but also smaller um, and medium-sized enterprises, as well as state-owned enterprises. The scope of uh, due diligence is also um, very different in the different um, drafts. We have the German law is only foreseen for uh, that companies are obliged to, to make due diligence for the first tier, so the um, first uh, supplier in their chain um, and others further down on, uh, along the supply chain, only if they have specific indications or reasons. Um, this is especially diff, uh, yeah, problematic for the, the extractive industry sector um, because um, the whole raw material, the mining um, uh, wouldn't be covered um, as this is further along the, the supply chain and is not covered in the first tier mostly. So um, the others, drafts on European level, or I have to say it's not yet a draft, but it's uh, um, the ideas of the European Parliament. Um, so they, uh, they are meant for the entire supply chain and um, also the UN treaty uh, scope of due diligence should cover all um, business activities along the entire supply chain. Um, it's also, there are differences with regard to an independent environmental due diligence. Um, the German law only foresees it for, um, for specific risks, um, but also only for um, uh, environmental, um, environmental damage, which is related to human rights abuses. So if there's uh, um, drinking water, um, uh, polluted or, or um, soil, which then uh, restricts the human right to um, 
to um, yeah, fresh drinking water, for example. Um, the EU, um, um, for the other two initiatives, it's, um, it's foreseen to have an independent environmental due diligence. So um, another important aspect is the whole discussion on liability. Um, in Germany, um, it's foreseen only to have uh, administrative liability, um, which would be very uh, yeah, weak. Um, and uh, the other two um, initiatives uh, provide uh, provisions for civil as well as criminal um, ad and administrative liability. Um, also with regard to access to a remedy, we have differences um, here too. The German law is uh, re rather weak or the German draft law is very weak um, for with regard to the, um, the others, um, there are further, further provisions that um, could really um, help um, victims of human rights violations in foreign countries to go to, um, to, uh, to, the, to, the, um, to the other countries where the, uh, the TNC has its, um, its main um, uh, headquarter, for example and go to the um, go there to to find um, a remedy when we now have a look on how these um, the current um, yeah draft laws are um, uh, considering the gender dimension we have to say that the german law um, is very much lacking behind um, i will go to this for, uh, later on um, the, the EU um, parliamentary um, report and ideas for uh, EU directive um, take the gender dimension into account. They, um, they uh, have decided that um, this provision that undertakings are encouraged to integrate a gender perspective into their due diligence processes. I'm struggling a bit if uh, it's, it's um, if encouraged is maybe that might be too weak and um, we, we need that it's uh, clearer formulated um, like a um, really mandatory to, to take the gender perspective into the due diligence processes. Um, with regard to the um, UN treaty, there we um, have to say that it's really, um, um, we can see quite good um, consideration of the gender dimension. Um, this is um, mainly due to the to a um, working group of the NGO uh, Civil Society Treaty Alliance, um, the Feminists for Binding Treaty, which has done really great work in the last years um, with regard to this uh, the draft of a UN treaty. They have been advocating a lot for for integrating the gender dimension. And we uh, really see, I have put these two, um, these two articles of the preamble of the current draft for legally binding instrument on the screen. Um, and we see that it's really, um, it takes it uh, very um, yeah, prominently already into account. When we have a closer look on specific, um, on the specific aspects, um, we can see that, for example, the German um, law does not even mention the, um, the um, CEDAW, the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Dif Discrimination Against Women um, into account. It's, um, it's really, uh, yeah, it, it seems very strange that they haven't included it. Um, and I think at least this would be something very important to to uh, change in the current uh, drafting process. Um, the um, considerations and ideas from the European Parliament as well um, as the current draft um, are mentioning CEDAW um, and also apply um, the gender or ask for gender responsive due diligence processes. Um, we can see that um, also with regard to the risk of sexual harassment and violence, um, 
which is um, which Judy and and Lynn also uh, referred to, um, is a specific risk for women, and um, but it's not taken into account um, uh, into various uh, on EU level as well as in on the German level. Um, we can see that um, also on EU level and in the UN treaty, it's explicitly referred to that uh, women should be um, uh, yeah, covered or consulted during the whole um, due diligence processes. Um, and we can also see that um, with regard to reparations and remedies, um, gender responsive, um, they, they should be gender responsive. So um, I have one important aspect too. Um, that uh, gender disaggregated data should be um, uh, um, yeah, collected during the whole due diligence processes, meaning, for example, the gender pay gap or also gender pension gap um, or women in, in power positions and leading positions. Um, we, unfortunately, we cannot see any of these um, these aspects in any of the initiatives so far. Um, so the German supply chain law uh, really needs improvement, um, not only with regard to the gender dimension, um, but in general um, for with regard to covering the whole um, supply chain um, to explicitly um, call for civil liability provisions. Um, and also to integrate uh, an independent environmental due diligence requirements um, and especially also to, um, to apply it to all companies, um, um, not only to companies with 1,000 employees, but others too. Um, I'm sorry, I feel like I have a bit of disorder of my <laughs> presentation. <laughs> but um, I try to, to go through it um, quickly. Um, yeah, we, um, a number of NGOs here in Germany, we, um, we, um, uh, we made concrete policy uh, demands on policymakers and businesses um, with regard to on how to integrate a gender, um, gender dimension into the current draft um, of uh, supply chain law. Um, and I think uh, a lot of them we have already touched in previous slides. Um, one specific demand would be really to, to integrate a gender um, uh, specific due diligence and impact assessment. Lynn has already um, uh, mentioned that um, to have a look on which specific risks uh, women face um, before a project starts, um, but also during the whole um, operation of a, of a company. Um, yeah, and there they should um, refer to the various risks that um, they can see. Um, or that are um, especially for uh, relevant for women. Um, then they should provide specific uh, measures that um, are gender specific to prevent and uh, to remedy. Um, I mentioned here a few like equal pay for equal work, equal access to management positions, zero tolerance for sexual violence, um, the recognition of sexual and reproductive health and rights like maternity um, protection, access to social security systems. Um, we haven't mentioned yet um, the topic of trade unions and women in trade unions. I think that's something very um, important too. Um, and uh, another aspect would be family friendly working hours, parental leave regulations. Um, I already mentioned the importance also to um, report by using gender disaggregated data. Um, and last but not least, um, companies should um, provide accessible complaint mechanisms that take into account, for example, uh, illiteracy from women um, or also time restrictions due to, um, to the gender care gap. Um, and um, yeah, 
so that this all is possible um, we is um, is quite clear and there are existing already um, quite good tools um, for companies to to um, assess it and to apply it for the various sectors um, for example Shedil, um that's an online tool developed um, by, uh, by the Forum on Women and Development, a Norwegian NGO. Um, this is based on this uh, guidance on, on the gender dimension on the UN guiding principles. And um, we can see here um, that they, for example, um, propose to, to, uh, to look on the risks for their direct employers to subcontractors to agents, recruiters, and facilitators, but also to external stakeholders. I think this is meant for um, mainly um, women and um, communities um, where, for example, mining, um, mining projects are done. Um, yeah, so um, I'm coming to the end of my presentation. If you have further um, questions or um, need for further information you can find it on our website um, and also um, uh, for example uh, following the hashtag uh, feminists for binding treaty um, there are quite a lot of um, interesting interesting news coming up and uh, by the way um, here I mentioned the, the uh, German um, position paper but we have a translation into English so yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Caroline. This is really um, comprehensive and a lot of insights and uh, um, it was uh, really good to have the overview also, the comparison between the different regulations, um, especially with regard to the sometimes lacking gender dimension. Um, I think the, the papers that you mentioned, we could also share them afterwards um, if we can't um, uh, find them now to post them here in the chat. So in the follow-up email, you can have them. Um, and I would now like to use this input from Caroline also to, um, to open the discussion um, between the speakers, but also with questions from the audience. So if you have some, you can write them in the chat and um, Julius will, will give me a sign. Um, we have now spoken a lot um, about the political regulations going on and the potential for gender responsive due diligence of corporations. And now we want to bring the local level, the perspectives from Judy and Lynn together with this political debates and really see um, what would be the potential for women on the ground, for women in the communities, in indigenous women um, in the Philippines, for uh, small scale miners in the Great Lakes region, for example, or also women um, elsewhere who are affected by the mining sector. Um, so maybe I could um, give the question back to Judy and Lynn now to also um, give their view. What is the potential of, um, of gender responsive corporate due diligence with the elements that Caroline mentioned, but maybe you have other elements, um, gender elements that corporations should take into account. Um, what, what do you think of, of these regulations and the gender perspective Caroline has mentioned? Wants to start, Judy? <laughs> yeah, first of all, I'm really happy to hear Carolyn. It's um it's been a while since uh we were involved in the maybe two years ago in the in the campaign for for binding treaty. Um and then you know all of this happened on the ground and we somehow lost track. And now it's really good that um for here to hear you articulate all of these uh gender specific asks uh, for the for, for these uh, mechanisms and <clears throat> that's really very helpful I'm taking down so much notes here already um, because especially um, two weeks ago we had uh, what we call mining hell week <laughs> it's a week long of uh, activities and forums uh, uh, on mining and one of our discussions was focused on um, the Mark Copper disaster, which we call it, um, which happened in 1987. Uh, it's a Canadian mining corporation, and it has devastated. Uh, the mining tailing spawn collapsed. Um, two, two, uh, two tailing ponds in two years in a row. 
Um, and so it has basically killed the rivers, Boac and La, Magpog rivers there. And where are they now? You know, the, the, the rural women who have filed for compensation and damages, um, 13 of them already died. Um, because that's how long it took the legal process. And up until now, there's nothing. There's no nothing to show for. Um, and um, this corporation has showed so much skill in actually going around and escaping the liabilities that they have. And so, and so yeah, we're very much pushing for a legally binding treaty that would not just um, stop at having due diligence, which is a very good step. But as um, Carolyn was saying, push, push for more. Um, they have they have rights. These corporations have rights. They they they're very proud to say that they have rights, but they don't have obligations. How could that be? You know, so you have when you have rights, you have to have obligations, and and you have to be made accountable. And so and that's very much needed, very much needed at this time, not just in the Philippines but elsewhere, where these mining corporations uh, are causing so much havoc in the lives of. Uh, women and their families. Thank you so much, Judy, for your point of view and um, your thoughts on this. Mm, I'm looking in the, <laughs> the group if anybody wants to react, um, if Lynn also wants to, to say something on the question. Not for now. All right. Um, Julius, you will give me a sign if, if questions. Yes. There are questions uh, to Caroline in particular. Uh, the first one is uh, concerning the tool you presented, uh, SheDill. Um, the question is, what do you think of it? Is it effective? And how can we make sure it won't be used by companies just as a label without any effect? Yes, um, yeah, thank you for this question. Um, I discovered this this tool also uh, very recently only um, and as far as I know it's existing only um, uh, for one year now or it has been published last year so I think we um, there are not yet any um, results on on how effective it is actually um, but uh, as a first look I, I can see it's a tool to help um, companies um, to to um, consider the various risks um, and it I, I just pointed it out that that uh, such tools are already existing but um, of course it, it needs um, more it needs this um, this uh, liability it needs the mechanisms of sanction um, uh, in order to hold them really ac to account and um, that it's not something only on the paper that they can show and say, oh yeah, um, we are we are uh, covering it, um, and I think it also needs um, yeah really meaningful consultation with women and not like Judy was uh, pointing out that there's a recruit uh, a, a woman recruited and she's everything doing but um, the communities are not consulted um, and I think um, that's that would be very important. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's one more question for you. Um, maybe you already uh, read it in the chat. Uh, it's uh, concerning the recommendations uh, you presented uh, concerning the legislation requirements, I think. Um, but the question is, uh, who are the stakeholders uh, that you are targeting to change uh, the operational landscape for women in the mining sector? Um, I'm not sure if I understand it correctly, but um, yeah, I think with this, um, um, with these uh, demands, we are addressing, uh, first of all, the, the, uh, the German government um, to put into place such regulation that uh, really covers or um, respects and considers the gender dimension. Um, and we, we ask the German government to put into place uh, a due diligence uh, a law um, that obliges companies um, that, for example, operate 
um, in in the mining sector uh, in in the Philippines um, to um, make gender impact assessments and so on um, and to make this gender sensitive due diligence um, I think for Germany we we don't have mining uh, companies that operate in in the Philippines I'm not sure but um, at least for example the um, car industry um, they have uh, um, they have uh, they need a lot of these minerals that uh, maybe um, come from the uh, Great Lakes region or from the Philippines and they would be apply, uh, obliged to um, make these due diligence assessments um, along their entire supply chain. And in the best case, for the moment, it's only for the first for the first uh, supplier. But um, yeah, and I think that that would change it somehow. I hope I answered this question. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, <laughs> ask again. <laughs> yes, you can clarify in the chat whether the question was answered uh, for you yes um i think that's that we have persons saying hi in the chat <laughs> which is also fine but i would give over to lara maybe you have more questions you want to ask yeah thank you um yeah some more questions but um, maybe also the audience has some more um afterwards um, I would also like to know, and um, maybe maybe Lynn could answer best, but maybe also the others. Um, what could be the impact of um, the regulations mentioned um, at European level, um, German level, international level, also for the for the artisanal small scale mining sector? And are there risks related to such regulations? Do we need also some other pieces of um, legislation or um, some other reforms, um, improvements to really also in improve the situation of artisanal small-scale um, miners, for example, in the Great Lakes region? Um, thanks. I, I, I could say many things on, on this, but I, 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 th I think of, of one, one main outcome of these regulations that, that uh, Caroline has shared and all these processes that the most uh, significant one I see is is in relation to formalization and and for formalization it has uh, two sides like a coin with two sides so on the on the one hand um, it's a it's a good thing uh, I, I, first of all let me make the connection between formalization and and the regulations that that have been shared of course, when you want to do due diligence, the, the real understanding of it, the, the following of the, of the mineral from the mine site to the point of export, uh, you need to, to have um, organized, organized groups, right? So the, the ASM sector needs to first get organized before it can effectively be part of the processes of due diligence. So formalization is great. One side of the coin is, is that it's great um, especially if we're talking about women's rights with, within the ASM sector. It is, it's great because it presents an opportunity for women to organize, to, to come together, to have one voice um, on, on the issues that concern them. But also when we think about financial inclusion, the, 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 the opportunity that, that uh, formalization brings is that, is that women can together uh, save money and, and put together little, little monies from whatever other income generating activities that they do, and then take that money and invest it in, in, in the mining sector. So maybe they can have a, a mining pit that they own together and, and, and use money from elsewhere, brought together uh, as part of their association and use it to invest uh, and improve production at, at their pit. However, on, on the other side of, of this formalization coin, um, is that is that when when things begin to be organized, what we have seen uh, in, in experience is that the, one of the first uh, stages of of mining that that get mechanized uh, is the processing stage, and yet again, when you understand the mining sector, the artisanal mining sector, the processing stage is where most women are involved directly in the mining. In the, in the ASM sector. So 
when when machinery comes comes in bore mills in the in the gold mining sector zeds and all of these things crushers in the development mineral sector um and so on it means that 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 uh, even the little uh opportunity that 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 women would have had to participate in the sector and 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 gain some income uh is taken away because obviously machines are, are, are always manned by men uh, uh at 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 processing sites so for me this is the the thing that i see it's it's a bit it it goes deeper into the issues of of the asm sector but i think it's something that that we need to continually think about even when we advocate for these uh, great regulations. Thank you so much, Lynn. This was um, really great also to focus a bit on, on the, the impact on the ASM sector. Um, I can't see questions in the chat, but maybe you know, there have uh, not been any other questions. Um, so we have spoken a lot about um, corporate due diligence regulations like the supply chain law in Germany, the mandatory due diligence law at European level that is supposed to come and the UN binding treaty. And we have also spoken about the gender elements. Um, Caroline has, has enumerated them really, um, really well. And um, Lynn has also mentioned them before. Um, but what what else would need to change at political level? Are there other um, regulatory pieces that could be um, a lever to improve the situation of women's rights? Or maybe also besides the political landscape, um, what would need to change? And this could be a question to, to all three of you, I think. Who wants to start? I think I could jump in there. Uh, and 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 just say that uh, the issue of investment, you know, investment in in gender, and it not doesn't necessarily mean financial investment, but of course, financial investment is a big part of this. Uh, financial, technical skills development, um, and and so on. So so the the what would be a political ask or a big a big thing that 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 i i would like to see more and more i think it's the issue of investment investment in gender um and and for me again being passionate about the the asm sector so investment in in, in women within the asm sector um within the great lakes region the asm sector produces the biggest amount like i said 90 percent of our minerals um, uh, are produced within within this sector. So investment is 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 important at all levels. Whether it's it's redistribution of taxes at at national government levels to 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 make sure that uh, women are empowered and they're more involved in the mining sector, or it is companies uh, very specifically uh, uh, drawing up budgets that that uh, cater to gender issues. Or oh, it's international development work donors uh, prioritizing financial and technical support to to gender and mining. All of these uh, levels of investment, I think, are very very important. And and may maybe part of our advocacy at the international level could be to 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 put some requirements in some of these these uh, regulations uh, for companies to to do some sort of um, affirmative action. When it comes to to uh, to women within the mining sector, then at that point, our good ideas and our our passion uh, is is tagged to money, uh, which is what is really needed uh, to to empower women in, in the sector. Thanks, Lynn. Um... I think the others also wanted to react. I'm not sure. <laughs> Caroline or Judy, if, yes, go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would also say um, something that is very important is um, tax uh, to fight tax avoidance by transnational corporations, um, because this has a, also a huge impact on women's rights. Um, um, when we see, for example, that uh, I think there are two, 200 billion each year that um, the global south um, governments are losing um, uh, in dollars um, uh, as uh, from tax avoidance and this is money that uh, 
that um, the public purse, the states are not having for, for example, providing um, uh, public services like uh, healthcare, public healthcare, like uh, childcare, like school, and especially these uh, public uh, infrastructure and services are especially important for, for um, women and um, to empower women, to enable women to, to go to work, to uh, earn their own money and so on, and to um, lower the burden of, of uh, care. Um, I think that is something very important. And I think in, the, in this whole tax avoidance, um, government should work more together. Um, there are various processes on, on UN level for more cooperation um, that government um, transnational corporations uh, don't um, yeah, uh, go to tax paradises or don't shift their profits to other countries um, where there are lower taxes. Um, I think that would be something very important. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, um, Lynn and Carolyn. Um, these are very, um, good policy uh, policy um, proposals that um, that we can really push forward together I mean separately in the Philippines but also collectively um, but and, and to add to that I, I was just uh, again coming from our context um, what has to change is the corporatization of uh, basic social services what the government is doing now is that in the past governments are relying heavily on corporations to provide um, basic social service services for impoverished communities. They always say we don't have the budget and therefore we rely on corporations and investments to provide these social services. And so at that instance, it has uh, relinquished its governance over that community and over that those provinces. And there, and the corporations become lords over the gods of these of these uh, corporate uh, of these areas, and so that has to change. Um, if the government, if the state provides or does its obligation, um, then the communities will have a leverage um, to really decide and have a, an informed decision whether to allow these mining projects or not. But now they're beholden because they rely heavily on these corporations for their social services. And the second one is to demilitarize the whole process of, of, um, of, uh, of, of uh, the mining industry. I, no, I'm sorry. Demilitarize the process of uh, the consent and uh, um, assessments, the, all these uh, permit processes. Now we have... Uh, as secretary of the Department of Environment and Natural Resources uh, and a retired military. Now we have a National Commission on Indigenous Peoples, which takes care of the issuance of free prior informed consent, a military, and they're all focused on um, anti-terrorist um, activities and um, counterinsurgency. So all of the opposition that happens along the way uh, is being mis is being understood or taken as uh, an anti-terrorist or anti-insurgency or, or, or part of the insurgency issue. And so this has to change uh, in order to have a safe uh, and free uh, consultation and processes of, 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 um, of all these development projects entering the community. Thank you so much, Trudy. It was already uh, almost a, clo a closing remark. Um, it, we are already, um, yeah, we have already come to the end of our time, um, even though we could debate much longer, I think, and dive much deeper into different aspects. Um, so maybe we can continue in another um, framework, this discussion, and I hope that we will still collaborate afterwards. Um, and. Uh, I think a lot of aspects have been have been covered. We have also spoken a little bit at the beginning about uh, the individual level and what we could also do as um, civil society also in the global north and also in different regions, um, how we can support each other and um, that we need to um, make pressure also on the governments and in the countries where the transnational companies are often based. 
and I think um, there are a lot of um, yeah a lot of uh, political debates going on with um, regulations upcoming. So hopefully this will have an impact also a positive impact on the situation of um, women in the mining sector and around the mining sector communities indigenous women. Um, yeah, we, we don't have much more time now, but I think we can share afterwards um, the links um, that have been uh, mentioned to documents and um, give you a short follow up. Um, yeah, and I would like to thank all of you for your great insights for your time and and um, it was really a pleasure to to debate with you thank you so much thank you thank, thank you lara thank you thank you thank Julia. Happy women's thank month. you carolyn mm -hmm. thank you judy <laughs> yes happy women's month to you too happy thank women's month and take care i really hope COVID won't affect you much more than it's already done yeah thank you thank, thank you very you. much for your too. time Thank you. Bye. Thank you. We'll hear Bye. From you. Take yeah. care. Bye. Sollen wir noch drin bleiben? Die Oder? anderen sind, glaube ich, schon rausgegangen, ne? Ja. Dann ähm, schreibe ich Ihnen hinterher nochmal. Okay, dann mache ich zu. Ja, kannst du gerne machen. <lacht>